who is the research manager at WEI in South Africa. Uh, if you didn't have a chance to watch her lecture on elephants and how they use their natural environment, um, you can scroll back to the beginning or go and find her lecture on YouTube. It's really worth your time. Uh, lots of great videos of elephants and really interesting information about how they're using the environment in South Africa. And sounds like a lot of people did watch it because we got in quite a lot of questions about elephants and about Gabby's research. So I'm really excited to just dive right in and, and chat with her uh, a bit more about these amazing mammals living in, in Southern Africa and across the whole continent. Um, so while we're chatting, if you have any questions, as always, feel free to put them in the chat, either on Facebook or on YouTube, or you can email us at xc2 at opwall.com. And if you're watching from the Opwall website, you can click the YouTube button and it'll open the stream in a new tab so you can access the chat. Um, actually, we have a new feature as well. If you are interested in getting a notification every time we post a new lecture, um, plus a little bit more information about our speakers, um, some of the Opwall papers, you can sign up for the newsletter on the XC2 page on the Opwall website if you just put in your email address. So um, with that said, I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Gabby Taran. Thanks so much for joining us this morning all the way from South Africa. Thanks, Sophia. It's um, late afternoon here, so it's uh, the sun's going down. It's quite a beautiful day, um, but yeah, glad to be chatting to you. Well, I'm, I've recently found out that there, you have a very small time difference with the UK. So, um, well, but it must be it must be entering winter there. Is it is it getting cold yet? It is. It is definitely um, a red wine weather, which is always delightful. Um, but certainly. Uh, not as cold as um, probably the UK gets in, in winter, but we, we still have any excuse to put a fireplace on, which is great. Fair enough. Sounds really beautiful. Um, well, so I really enjoyed watching your lecture. Obviously, you know, partially we, everyone loves to see videos of elephants and hearing about all of the really cool innovative research that you guys are doing, especially, um, you know, looking at kind of endocrinology and um, how elephants are expressing stress and stuff like that was, was fascinating. Um, so what is it about elephants specifically that makes you so passionate about them and made you get into this research? Um, yeah, fascinating question. I think that anyone who's ever seen an elephant in the wild will 99.9% .9 of the time fall in love with them in some way. I think they're just incredible animals. And so, I mean, firstly, they're, they're massive and they're large and people go and see them, but they're kind of congruent to that. Their gentle nature and their societies and their intelligence is all inspiring. And I think we've only really scratched the surface of what makes elephant society so interesting and, and their bonds and their different personalities. Um, you know, how I got into elephants was via the biodiversity route and really having a look at the effects of elephants more than elephants themselves. So my original field work was looking at um, trees and tree damage from elephants and trying my best to avoid them at all possible costs because I was doing all of this um, field work on foot in very kind of dense uh, shrubby areas when you don't really want to be surprised by, by elephants. Um, and then just, just learning from the perspective of how they choose their food, which seems such a simple thing. How elephants, you know, kind of select the food that they're, they're eating, which plants, which plant species, how they teach their um, calves what to eat. It's, it opened up a whole world of elephant language, um, if I can say that, and how they just view their environment. So the more reading you do about elephants, and I think the more you see elephants, the more fascinating they become. Um, elephants and warthogs are the two species that you can watch all day long because they're always doing something interesting. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think just to see them would be, would be to get it. Yeah, that makes sense. I remember being on safari in, in Kenya and just, you know, seeing a troop of elephants and seeing how they interact and you know, the babies and the matriarchs and everything, you almost feel like you're watching people in some way. And I think maybe that that kind of humanism to them also obviously makes them so special. Um, so obviously, I think 
a lot for a lot of people looking at doing biology or biodiversity research doing big mammal research in Africa is probably one of the most exciting things that you could possibly imagine. Not to say that there's not amazing other tracks, but I think a lot of people get excited about this research, you know, watching documentaries about Africa and seeing lions and um, elephants and zebra and stuff like that. So if someone wants to get involved with uh, large mammal research in Africa, what would be your suggestion for the best way of getting started? It's, it's a great question. I think you've hit the nail on the head, though, that large mammals are incredibly sexy. Um, and yet, I think what happens 90% of the time on the ground, even when you're studying large mammals, is you're not actually watching large mammals. There's only a small proportion of that kind of studies are behavioral based. And you're normally looking at either an effect or um, habitat or all sorts of other things in ecology. Um, having said that, it's, it's still an amazing field and I think there's still so much that needs to be studied and researched. Um, and it's quite difficult to get into the field sometimes and I think they're probably simplifying it, there's two routes. One is the academic route and you can go to university and you know, kind of get your degree and come out to Africa and do research and that doesn't have to be potentially with a an African university, it can be with um, university in your home country. And I think that particularly that's where Aqual plays such a great role is that you can experience different environments if you, if you think they're great and you think you really wanna learn more, is you go there and you get into the field and you have those early mornings and you have the, you know, down on your hands and knees on 42 degree heat and that whole sexy kind of appeal sometimes loses its edge and sometimes it doesn't. Um, and I think just getting into the field and meeting people and discovering what there is to do is really valuable. So the academic field, you know, do your dissertation, your master's, potentially PhD, see what happens, opens up. And I think then there's also the wildlife management um, tourism field, which potentially is slightly harder to get into in terms of careers for, for foreigners but is, is equally um, rewarding. And you probably spend more time out in the field with the animals than you would potentially doing a PhD because half of the time you're behind a computer. Sure. I think it really depends on, you know, what your goals are and what you enjoy doing. So my advice always to young biologists or, or people that want to, they think they want to become biologists, is get into the field, go and do some field work, experience the highs, the lows, the dealing with the data, everything and meet people and just soak up all of the knowledge that you can from everyone and then see see where it leads you um sometimes the best laid plans are non-existent and you just kind of go where it takes you i think that's really good advice honestly i i, I you know getting started and doing a shorter trip like an up while trip and being in the field i think you're right that field work very quickly loses its sexiness and naturally weeds out people who are really, really passionate about the work and, and love being in the field, even when it means you're, you know, digging insects out of poo for 12 hours a day, which it frequently does, or whatever else strange and unsexy, glamour, unglamorous. I think work that's activity. fantastic. Super oh, I completely agree. Obviously, people who do op well are a very self-selecting group um, of slightly crazy people. Um, we love, you know, being out in the field and it's, I think it's great to get that hands-on experience, you know, before you dive into something that's going to be four or five or 20 years of your life, because, you know, for obviously I, I agree, you know, large mammal research can seem amazing, but it's definitely not that you're on safari every single day and, you know, getting a chance to go out with a group like WEI and, you know, seeing what that really means for people like you who are doing it, I think is a great experience for for young people wanting to get into field research um, and also meeting people and you know knowing who is working there is fantastic. Um, you mentioned the other way of getting into you know working with elephants and other large mammals would be kind of on the tourism side, which obviously is a side that's particularly interesting to me as a, you know as a sustainable way of funding conservation. Um, but you know one of the questions that came up is kind of is is tourism in South Africa 
or you know in, in African wildlife areas a sustainable way to fund conservation given kind of what's happened with the current pandemic and what could happen to halt tourism again in the future? Wow, um, yeah, it's it's a massive question that I think a lot of people are, are looking at. And certainly we live in unprecedented times. And I think, you know, no one has a crystal ball in terms of seeing what, what will work. In terms of sustainability, I think tourism has always proved it's one of the most sustainable options for conserving large areas um, in terms of you know, getting funding and being self-supporting. And I think it will really depend on how quickly people's appetites for travel come back. Um, so if we can see the resilience of the, the tourism industry will really give us an idea of how sustainable it, it would be. But I think it's taught everyone many valuable lessons um, in this whole pandemic. And I think one of them is that you can't put all of your eggs in, in one basket, to use a really cliched mm -hmm. phrase. Yep. And I think we're all trying to now develop new ways to you know, kind of look at the environment and, and see how we can work with it and benefit from it and kind of make it sustainable. Yep. So I think tourism, is still a really good option. I think it's still one of the best options and in some areas it's the only option. Yeah. Um, but we just need to be, I think, more less complacent, if that, if that makes sense, around what this, what this does and making sure that in really difficult times when we don't have a bunch of tourists, we use those as opportunities. Um, and I think a lot of people are doing that all over the world in all industries, not just yeah. tourism and not just conservation. People have seen the challenges of this time as opportunities to invent things. And I think it's, it can be really exciting, a really exciting time, um, apart from all of the stress and everything else. So, yeah, I do think tourism has its place. Okay. I, I mean, I completely agree. And obviously, there are things that we still need to improve about the tourism industry around the world that could potentially make it more efficient in terms of how it's supporting these conservation projects, which might mean we can accept fewer tourists in the long term, um, but still have enough income to, to support projects. Um, so shifting a little bit into kind of the specific research that you were doing with the elephants in new environments. Um, so you, um, you, you were talking a lot about kind of trans moving elephants between different environments and seeing how they cope um, within this the Cape Floral region. Um, so now the elephants, you found that elephants can cope there. Are there plans to introduce more elephants to the area? Um, I think the quick answer would be no. I okay. think we, we've only really scratched the surface of, you know, how elephants live in this environment. Mm -hmm. The fact that they can is the first part of the puzzle. And I think, you know, elephants being such complex creatures, we need to see about all of their other needs. Are their behavioral needs being addressed? Are their um, kind of long-term needs being addressed? You know, an elephant can live up to 70 years. Are those 70 years in a Thainbos environment or a Cape Floral region environment um, really good for both the elephant and for the environment? Mm -hmm. And I think it's certainly opened up a new avenue, but elephants need lots of space yep. and there is a limited amount of, of that space available for them. So I think it's really getting to understand them more now than introducing more and, and seeing what happens. Um, right. so, yeah. That makes sense. Um, so when you first moved the elephants to this area, did it take them a while to adapt to the new environment, you know, figure out what to eat, what not to eat? Uh, interesting. So the, the elephants that we worked with um, actually have a really interesting background story, which is something that I, you know, it's, it's kind of cool to go into. The one, a lot of elephants were a, um, a fully formed herd with their, their family that the whole herd was translocated. Um, and they came from an environment that, well, a region not too far away, very different environment, but within the reserve they're currently in now in um, the Cape Floral region, 
there are pockets of um, vegetation which were similar to the environment where they came from. Okay. And from all accounts, they certainly went into some of those areas immediately and were able to find the foods that they were accustomed to, to feeding. Um, and, you know, elephants are equipped with incredible senses, incredible sense of smell um, and taste and would be able to taste, you know, certain, certain foods and see whether they were um, delicious or not delicious. And then also communication. And I think as soon as one member of the herd would potentially taste something which wasn't that great, um, maybe the whole herd would have potentially known about it. So that was the one herd, I think they adjusted pretty quickly to the environment. Um, the other group which came in is, is really quite fascinating because this, I didn't really mention this before because it's not part of the, the bigger story, but they um, have interesting backgrounds in that two of the elephants came from captive situations. Um, okay. In fact, three or four of them. One of the elephants, in fact, um, came from a circus um, and she was... Uh, habituated to to people um, and you know a couple of the others were habituated to people yeah. and were then released onto the reserve and it's a major success story in some ways about how you can take animals from you know a very different condition and different um, environment where they are supplementary fed and you would take them into a an area where they're essentially behaving like normal elephants and they would have had to adjust to their environment no matter which, which space it was in. And I think the fact that they have thrived here and they've you know, had babies and they integrate with the other wild elephants and they display a lot of normal elephant behavior um, in some ways, I think is a major success story. And it also shows you how you can take elephants from those sorts of situations and release them. Um, yeah. I think just tourists driving through the reserve and watching these elephants wouldn't be able to detect which elephants came from the wild and which ones are newly wilded. So it's really interesting. That's a great success story. That's really, that's, and I'm, obviously it provides a lot of optimism, I think, for, you know, conservation of elephants that they can adapt so well to moving from a situation, not, not just of, you know, being born in captivity, but living for long periods of time in captivity and then being able to integrate with the herd and breed and everything like that. That's, that's exciting. And, you know, brings a little bit of joy. Um, so I know you, you do a lot of work in kind of elephant food choice and stuff like that. Do elephants have a favorite food? Uh, they do. Um, and that goes down to both an individual showing preference for certain foods as well as, you know, the species in, in an area. Yeah. And there's a lot of research which has had a look at elephant selectivity um, in terms of their food. They eat, they prefer certain species of, of trees and shrubs, for example. And they also prefer certain um, parts of the plant and at certain times of the year. So during winter, for example, they would eat the bark off of this one species. Um, and then during summer, they would ignore it. So oh. elephants show extreme kind of selection for, for what they eat. Um, and then the more time you spend with them and you get to know their individual personalities, you can see individuals actually selecting certain, you know, fruits, for example. Um, there's some things which are universally delicious to elephants, yeah. such as marula trees and marula fruits, which is kind oh. of the great African example. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like elephant ice cream. But there is, there's other, other plants which I think are also equally delicious and it depends what's available. Um, I think the matriarch tends to make a lot of the choices around where the animals eat and then they kind of would select different plants within that area. Oh, very cool. I mean, they're so interesting with all these different choices. I mean, it really feels like you can relate to them. Um, so, Obviously, the, the Cape Floral region, the, the Fambos, where you're working, is a very unique uh, part of Africa, kind of an, an environment, a habitat that's very rarely seen. Um, so I wonder if you could explain maybe how that kind of micro environment comes to exist and be, is such a rarity. Like, what, what are the climactic factors that are creating the Fambos? Yeah, good, good question. And it's... 
Um, interesting, what always blows my mind, and this is true of many environments, is the Cape Floral region, one of its characteristics is that it's extremely nutrient poor, which is why we were looking at whether elephants can, you know, survive off of the plants that grow there. Right. And you tend to find in some areas the highest biodiversity on the worst soils and kind of the worst regions. Um, and this is shown the world over. Yeah. So really poor soils, um, really old geology, um, and lots of mountains, and really horrible weather. If you're a plant, if you're an animal, it's hot and dry during summer, um, and windy and cold and wet during winter. And so that extreme environment has created extreme opportunities for uh, plants and then the animals that follow them. And the beach diversity, so the diversity that occurs across space is mind blowing. You can walk on a north facing slope of a mountain and then go around the side to a south facing slope. And within meters, it's completely different. Wow. because of the different moisture regime, the different sunlight it gets. Um, and you just get all these little pockets of different mountain ranges, seeing different areas, and which creates massive diversity. Um, and you get the lowlands versus uplands. So you've got topography differences as well as climatic differences on really poor soils. Huh. Very cool. It sounds like kind of, well, obviously very different, but just like the rainforest has very poor soil. And you would imagine that this place would be incredibly fertile, but just, you know, because of the heavy rains and, you know, years and years of years of, of having so many plants there, they, they have incredibly poor soil. Um, that's, that's fascinating that these areas that we see as so rich are often nutrient poor. Um, that's, that's interesting. Um, so are there any other radically different environments within Africa where elephants have disappeared from or are being considered to be reintroduced into? Oh, good question. I think in terms of radically different areas, the one that springs to mind is probably the Central African um, kind of equatorial rainforests. Yep. And I would probably be referring to the um, forest elephant species as opposed to the kind of savanna elephant species. And forest elephants have been um, in many areas um, eradicated for a very long time and they're central keystone species in those forests. A lot of the times you'll have trees that have very large fruits that will be um, spread only by elephants and those trees depend on the elephants eating those fruits and dispersing them in order for their population to disperse. You actually find this in um, Central American rainforests as well, where we used to have megafauna, and a lot of the big fruited tree species there can no longer actually um, reproduce right. because we've you know, lost all of the megafauna. So I would say probably the you know, rainforest areas is one of those unique situations where elephants have been removed and are vitally important to some of those ecosystems, even in just opening up the areas. Elephants are really big and they do an amazing job of opening up environments and clearing bush and that creates opportunities for other animals to to kind of go through very thick areas as well. They're great right. bush clearers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like just like tapirs a little bit is kind of the Central American example, which is obviously quite a lot smaller, but also have such an important role in seed dispersal. If they were to disappear, you would lose a great diversity of trees. Um, so it sounds it sound similar. Um, so we had a question come in about the behavioral research that you've done. So um, they were wondering how did you collect the behavioral data and which behaviors were you focused on? The person who sent this was a field assistant for a monkey project and wondering if there were any similarities. Interesting. Um, so the, the question we were trying to answer um, with our, our data was, their foraging behavior. And so we're particularly interested in foraging behavior versus other behaviors. And the data we were collecting was on what plants, animals, animals, elephants were eating, um, in which areas they were in, and particularly how long they were spending feeding on certain plants and in certain areas. 
And the really interesting part of it was number of successful mouthfuls. So an elephant, you know, will select a lot of food, um, you put it in its mouth, and then it might not taste very good, and so it would then come out. And so you can count the number of successful mouthfuls and the number of discarded mouthfuls over a set period of time, and you actually get kind of a forage intake rate. Huh. So it's, and that can then be related to energy budgets and eating in different environments. Um, and it's fascinating watching elephants. They will use their trunks and kind of search around in the ground to look for things. And as soon as they smell something delicious, because obviously their nose is at the end of the trunk, um, they would select that food and then put it in their mouth. And then sometimes it would drop out and sometimes it would actually be ingested. So oh. it's a super easy way to see whether they're selecting that plant or not um, and whether they, they find it um, delicious or palatable or not. Sometimes it's incredibly hard to see what plant species they were eating. Um, and this is, of course, is a classic example of studying super, something super sexy of elephant behavior, and you actually have to identify plant species. Um, but it's, which I find super sexy, but that's the point. So it's, that was one of the things we were looking at. And then just also looking at which elephants were selecting what. So were the big bulls selecting the same kind of food as some of the, you know, sub-adults, for example. With behavioral data, as I'm sure the, the kind of the person who sent in the question knows, you have to collect huge amounts of behavioral data to be able to analyze it statistically. And so we probably haven't collected enough data yet to um, have answers, concrete answers, but we can certainly show some general patterns, which is really interesting. Very cool. So I guess elephants are picky eaters too. Um, <laughs> I was I was actually going to say part way through that and you said it yourself because it sounds like that part was sexy because you got to look at the elephants but then you were running after them to see what they spat out and and you know examining those plants and species more carefully. Um, so we've got just about five minutes to go since we got started a little bit late so for anybody who wants to send in any final questions you can do so through xc2 at opwall.com or you can send them through the chat on Facebook or YouTube. Um, as we're wrapping up, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about kind of research um, and also I, I'd like to kind of finish up with a question about, you know, choosing to do a PhD, which I think I've asked almost every, everyone who's done a PhD because everyone has different reasons for, for doing it. And I think a lot of our viewers are, you know, early in the biology career and considering these kinds of steps. So first of all, before I get into that, I kind of wanted to ask what your thoughts are on expert-led volunteer data collection, which obviously gets into your work with OpWall, um, but you did a lot of work with students uh, on the research that you're doing and I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think it is amazing. I think the opportunities presented by expert-led volunteering um, outweigh some of the costs sometimes. So we have the ability to go into the field, collect large amounts of data, um, and we can do it sustainably, and we can do it you know, over different seasons and over different long periods, and long-term data is that ecological holy grail, which we're always striving for. Right. And it doesn't have to be particularly intensely kind of um, collected data, it can be quite broad data. So for example, the, we published this paper on basically taking photographs of, of elephants, um, which is a fantastic example of the data being used to answer quite smart questions, as well as how we can always go back in time and have a look at the actual data. So with the opening up of media, um, be it photographs or videos, um, that's increased the scope for expert-led volunteering. Yeah. It's also one of the reasons why I've got a massive camera trapping project at one of our other sites in our human wildlife conflict site. Camera traps, super time intensive to go through them and identify the actual species. Yeah. But we end up with this amazing data set, which we can always go back in time and have a look at certain subsets or even have a look at if species have been accurately identified. Um, and so as long as we ask the right questions and we design the, the research um, in a smart way, its opportunities are, are boundless. And I think it's, it's really important that people I think are realizing now more and more 
is that citizen science as, as one part of it is increasing and papers are being published. And you know, even if you just have an iNaturalist account and you log your species that you find in your garden, a lot of that and many people doing that can amount into a paper. And then you have expert led volunteering, which is a whole step up, which is, you know, kind of really overseen by experts. And it's, I mean, if you look at the publication rate of Aqual, it's, we've produced some amazing research. So I think it's, it's increasing in its scope. And I think we're only really starting now in the last kind of, you know, five, 10 years to see the benefits of it in the mainstream scientific audience, apart from the benefit that you get from education, which is often overlooked, and just the experience. And, you know, I think answering the question of a young biologist coming into the field of whether they want to be a field worker or not, um, or a field researcher, is a great contribution to science. So they've got that aspect as well. I've got a last question come in and then I guess we can we can chat really quickly about this PhD because you basically brought it up. Oh, completely um, with that, yes. Uh, no, 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 I, I was gonna ask you after anyway, but we just had a question come in um, from Callum who says, hi Gabby, I was an RA on this project and I was wondering if there are any cases of the elephants on the reserve interacting at all with other animal species did the captive slash circus bred elephants have any notable reactions to the other large animals or research vehicles? Uh, good question, Callum. Um, and hi, I remember um, long periods in the back of the vehicle with you. Um, <laughs> I think it's, you know, you've always got to be in the right place at the right time to see interactions. It's also one of those things which is really interesting. I haven't observed many interactions. Um, sometimes the elephants would um, kind of chase off rhino because a rhino also being extremely big animals think that they have right of way and would be walking around. Um, and the elephants would also think they have right of way and so it might get a bit pushy. Um, I think elephants are naturally curious, but over a long period of time, they would have acclimated to their curiosity about certain species. Um, but certainly, the younger elephants always show a lot more curiosity as they're learning about their environment. And we've seen some interaction with the younger elephants, um, interacting with even birds, for example. We have cattle egrets, which hang around the herbivores to um, get the insects, which the herbivores stir up. Sometimes when the younger elephants are bored, they will go and chase the cattle egrets because that's a fun toy in their environment. So you've got to be really lucky um, to be at the right place at the right time to catch some of these interactions. That's great. Well, just to close out then, I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about what made you choose to do a PhD in your given field and what advice you might have to someone who's considering the option of doing a PhD or even just a master's with you know, in not necessarily in biology, I suppose, but in their field. Yeah, PhDs are one of those interesting things is that they're super personal and everyone's PhD experience is a personal experience. And so it's interesting that you can ask five people about their PhDs and they may have a very different experience to another five. Yes. I think if research, for me, the, the PhD came about because I had big questions and I needed big answers. Yeah. And the only way to really get some of those big questions and tackle them in depth was to do a PhD. Um, and I think unless you have an extreme drive to find out some of these, these questions, um, you should seriously consider it in light of all of the other options available to you. In the past, you really only had, to, had the PhD available in terms of getting into, into research as, a, as it were. Sure. And I think it comes down to the question more than a lot of people will come into a PhD going, I really want to study whales, or I really want to study um, chimpanzees. And I think I, what my advice to them is always, okay, but what is your question? Right. Unless you've got a really good research question, which is burning, which you have to answer, you may at some point down the line become disenchanted with you know, the fieldwork, the data collection, the analysis, the write-ups, 
the long hours behind the computer because a PhD is a big, it's a big thing. It's a big personal experience and it isn't for everyone. And I think people need to realize that and you shouldn't also feel bad if you're, you know, wanting to do a PhD or you're doing a master's and it's just not for you. It's not cut out for everyone. And there's many different opportunities and ways to get into biology or to get into research potentially without, without doing that. So for me, it comes down to the question, the drive. Well, I think that's great advice. And as you said, I think I've asked pretty much everyone who has a PhD who's come through here what they thought. And I think we've, we've gotten a different answer from everybody. So thank you so much for your insights and for your time, Gabby. It was great to hear a bit more about elephants and their behavior. And also I think about the, the unsexiness of field research, but how much fun it can be. Uh, I mean, obviously, I think you need to be honest about it and, and you need to love it for whatever reason that you, you know, you do love it. And I, I think it's fair to talk about you're not just on safari, especially when we're talking about big game research, big, you know, wildlife, big mammals in, in southern Africa, where it can feel maybe the most like it would be. Like um, because in many other areas, you're not going to see big mammals more than once in a lifetime. Um, so it was really great to have you here and hear more about your research. If you have any more questions for Gabby that come up in the future, please feel free to email us at xc2 at opball.com and we will get you and we'll send them over to her and um, have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Thanks Sophia.